Tonight, outdoor fitness is given the green light to resume on Monday in Toronto and Peel. It is definitely a challenge. We need to carry 10 bikes outside. The sprint for them to get ready while salons are told they can't reopen for another two weeks. Strong wake up call that we're just having right now. And CBC News uncovers startling new data about the COVID variants, showing they carry a 60% higher risk of death. <laughs> and the Ontario couple with 50 million new reasons to celebrate that may give you something to dream about tonight. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. We begin in Mimico tonight where two police officers have been injured after responding to an attempted bank robbery. One of the officers sustaining serious injuries. It happened at around 7.15 tonight. Here's more from the inspector on scene with what happened. And the initial information was that the bank was being held up by uh, two individuals. Uh, officers from 22 Division, uh, two of them, uh, rather got here almost immediately and they confronted these two males. And as a result, these two males were arrested and they're uh, currently uh, going to be charged with the, uh, the holdup. Unfortunately, the two officers sustained injuries. Uh, one of the officers, I can tell you, that has sustained a stab wound. Uh, he's currently at a trauma center. The second officer also sustained injuries uh, in relation, of, uh, relation to cuts from the, uh, the knife. All right, here's the good news, though. Both officers are in stable condition. Police say one of the suspects was arrested inside the bank. The other fled the scene on foot, but was detained shortly after. Police say the suspects are responsible for multiple robberies in the Etobicoke area. Now to the latest on the pandemic. And again today, Ontario reported more than 2,000 new infections of COVID-19. Still, the province announced more businesses will soon be allowed to reopen in the gray lockdown zones, including outdoor fitness classes and indoor salon services. It comes after beauty industry advocates publicly released a plea to the premier yesterday. Dahlia Ashri has more on how that home haircut could soon be behind us. Starting on Monday, this parking lot will see some objects wheeling in, but not cars. We're going to bring bikes outside every day to do classes as long as the weather's okay. Following the province's announcement today, outdoor fitness classes can resume outdoors with a 10 limit capacity. And while Deborah Menashe is thrilled she'll be able to resume spin classes, it won't be all that easy. But it is definitely a challenge. We need to carry 10 bikes outside and back in every day. We need to make sure we don't disturb the neighbors and keep the noise down. Um, we need to keep everyone separate and it's limited to 10 people. The province also announced today after four months, salons in gray zones can reopen indoors only at 25% capacity on April 12th. This comes one day after beauty industry advocates urged the province in an open letter to reopen. I am so excited. I cannot wait to go back. Uh, I miss my clients. <laughs> but Salon owner Michelle Bonnick is thrilled but is frustrated she still has to wait another two weeks. Plus, she's worried she'll reopen only to have to close again. Especially with the province announcing today nearby Hamilton will move back into lockdown on Monday. I don't have as dispensable income like I had before to carry me through this. How you doing? While business will soon be allowed indoors for the beauty industry, Menashe was hoping her fitness classes could go inside too. We have a thousand square feet in our room and we and we have an HRV system for fresh air. We can open doors to the outside. But infection control epidemiologist Colin Furness says that's still not safe enough. Breathing hard is a very risky thing when you're in a room full of people doing that because you are sharing air at a much greater rate. Regardless of how good the ventilation is, that strikes me as, as unreasonably risky. Menashe hopes to see outdoor fitness capacity increase and Furness says he doesn't oppose that idea. Dahlia Ashri, CBC News, Toronto. In terms of the actual case count today, it is the second day in a row. Ontario is reporting more than 2,000 new infections, just over 2,100 recorded today. There's also increasing concern about the number of people in hospital with the disease. There are now 401 people in intensive care in Ontario. That's the highest it's been since mid-January when there were 420 people in intensive care. Public health units also recorded 12 more COVID deaths today.
Now to a CBC News exclusive, and we've obtained new data from the province's science advisory table. It shows not only are the variants of concern more contagious, but they also double the risk of severe illness and carry a higher risk of death as well. Lauren Pelly now with the startling science. As the weather gets warmer and more people gather and mingle, CBC News has seen new data on variants in Ontario that might make all Canadians stop and think. An analysis from Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table found being infected with a variant means a 60% increased risk of hospitalization, a 100% increased risk of being admitted to an ICU, and a 60% increased risk of death, all compared to the original strain of this virus. So you're more likely to be admitted to hospital and to potentially die from the infection, regardless of your age. While Canadian seniors and long-term care residents are gaining protection from vaccinations, medical experts warn many younger adults working in the community remain vulnerable. Now we're seeing many, many more people uh, in their 30s, 40s and 50s with pretty severe disease. Thankfully, your personal risk of dying remains fairly small, so getting infected with a variant only increases your overall risk of death slightly. But with thousands of new cases every day, that adds up fast. The rough death rate in Canada right now is about 2.4 percent, or 24 people out of 1,000. And a 60 percent increase would mean around 38 people out of 1,000 dying instead. Strong wake-up call that we're just having right now. The head of Ontario's science advisory table warns if serious COVID-19 cases keep rising, it will have a ripple effect. Our, our healthcare system being overwhelmed will play a big, big role now in the coming days or weeks. That prompted a warning about provinces loosening restrictions too soon from Canada's chief public health officer. Uh, as soon as those variants take hold, things could escalate. So ease, ease anything um, and you have to be really thoughtful about it at this point in time. In Ontario, that decision rests with Premier Ford's government, with no major changes or restrictions announced just yet. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Sad news tonight out of Brampton, where a transit operator of more than 18 years has died after catching COVID-19. The transit worker was Dale Mutley Jacques. Earlier this month, Peel Public Health said it was investigating a number of COVID-19 cases among Brampton Transit employees, primarily en route 511, which runs along Steeles Avenue East. The union that represents Brampton Transit drivers said Jacques' route intersected with that line and he was an integral part of the service. They add Jacques was a friendly and outgoing person who leaves behind a wife and daughter. A GoFundMe page was set up for his family, and so far, more than $5,000 has been raised. Healthcare services in Brampton have been under the microscope this week, especially since the budget announced new provincial funding is coming to help address years of overcapacity conditions. The Premier and Brampton's mayor both say the new money means a new hospital in the city, but not everybody agrees with that. Lorenda Redekop explains why. Dozens of people protested ahead of the Premier's arrival. Most are truckers. One of their issues, not enough health care in a city where COVID-19 has hit hard. This week's budget said the government was adding a wing at this urgent care clinic. He's saying he's for the people, but he's not. There's, there's such a big population in Brampton, but how is this going to support all the population, especially with all these COVID cases? Ontario's Liberal leader joined the protesters. If I was adding an addition to my home, I wouldn't be calling it a new home. Doug Ford is once again trying to mislead the people of this region. These protesters are out in front of Peel Memorial. They hoped to confront the Premier, but in the end, they didn't see him on his way in. After entering through a different door, the Premier announced what he says is a hospital, expanding the current clinic. This hospital will include over 250 new patient beds. It will include a 24-7 emergency department. This will be an amazing state-of-the-art healthcare facility. We're turning an urgent care clinic 
into the desperately needed second hospital. Um, so I have to say uh, thank you to the Premier, thank you to the provincial government. The government announced it's providing $1.5 million now, plus $18 million to make the centre a 24-7 operation. A Brampton NDP member has questions about this project. This frankly is not an, uh, a development or a project for this year. This is an election promise. This is Doug Ford trying to gain political points and quite frankly misleading Bramptonians. Construction on the project will start in two years, at least two years too late for this man. Who knows what's going to happen until 2023. COVID cases are going up. ICU admissions are getting full. Brampton is a COVID nightmare. It's unclear when this new facility will be finished and open to the public. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Brampton. In Toronto, the age limit at mass immunization clinics has been lowered to anyone 70 years and older. The mayor says in the coming weeks, the city still has roughly 30,000 appointments available. But in neighboring Peel region tonight, some are saying they haven't been getting their fair share of the vaccines. Jessica Ng looks into that. I'm frustrated at, at all levels of government. Uh, Brampton the government Mayor Patrick Canada, Brown says sure. he is beyond frustrated at how vaccines have been procured and distributed in Ontario. But just hours before... If it wasn't for COVID, I was going to drive down to Queen's Park and give him a big hug. Because Mayor Brown was in a better mood. Today, Peel Public Health reported 384 new cases of COVID-19, a 25% increase in a week. Over 60% of those cases are in Brampton. It's unethical for the area that has been hardest hit by the, by the virus to have less than its per capita share. As a starting point, for me, that doesn't uh, add up. Today, residents lined up outside of one of Peel Region's mass vaccination clinics. On Monday, Peel Region received less than 7% of the vaccine supply, while 10% of all Ontarians live there. The region has now been upped to 9%, which is roughly 66,000 vaccines. Rick Hillier, chair of Ontario's COVID-19 task force, well, promising to be more equitable when it comes to vaccine distribution across the province on one of the last days he's in charge. The allocation will go by percentage of population. Because of the way it started, it has to be some adjustments. That's been occurring, but that's what the commitment is going forward from here. We need that ethical framework applied as well. Since we're 20% of the cases, we really need to be up closer to 20% of the vaccine because until that vaccine is brought under control, transmission is brought under control here in the region. Dr. Lawrence Lowe, the region's medical officer of health, says recent volatility of vaccine supply has been troubling, though it is stabilizing. And I am very hopeful in anticipating that we will continue to receive allocations that will allow us uh, to uh, control the pandemic in our community. A community that has been busy and, according to Mayor Brown, working at full capacity in its two largest sectors, transportation logistics and food processing. If you order goods online, it's going through Brampton. If you go to a grocery store from B.C. to Nova Scotia, there's someone in Brampton who's uh, processed that food. And so we've taken a heavy toll. You know, our residents have been going to work at a, at a higher risk of COVID-19 to maintain Canada's supply chain. Jessica Ng, CBC News, Toronto. Peel Police launching Project Noisemaker tonight. It's in response to this, the community's concern about noise pollution and excessively loud vehicles on roadways. A little cooler tonight, but uh, in the last week, the weather has been warmer. And with the warmer, ve uh, warmer weather, we expect that people are going to open their windows, get fresh air in. We want them to. And they're starting to hear the noise of these vehicles more and more now. The project launches early this year and will be extended into the fall to tackle the issue. For the next six months, police will focus on reducing the number of vehicles with modified or excessively loud exhaust systems on the roads. Owners could face fines of up to $300, and anyone caught with an unlawfully modified vehicle could have their insurance policy suspended. It's actually scary to us. And of course, it's scary to the parents. Coming up, optometrists say an increase in screen time is having a negative effect on your kids' eyes. We'll have more on the concerns and tips on how to keep them healthy right after the break. Plus. After a very wet, especially morning today, we have a dry period coming through. I'm meteorologist Colette Kennedy, but it doesn't last all weekend. So come back and I will have your complete weekend forecast.
Ontario's opposition leader is calling on the Ford government to declare March 30th an annual day of mourning to remember the victims of COVID-19 in Ontario's long-term care homes. Tuesday the 30th is the date on which Doug Ford claimed that there was going to be a, an iron ring around long-term care. The iron ring never showed up. Uh, and so the Premier needs to acknowledge that, to, that he didn't, um, he wasn't being honest with the people of Ontario. Andrea Horvath is asking the Premier to issue a formal apology for failing to protect seniors and staff, as she puts it. She made the appearance at Orchard Villa Retirement Community in Pickering, where 70 residents have died over the course of the pandemic. Family members of those who have died also joined her for the announcement. More than 3,700 residents have died in long-term care homes in Ontario. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a big impact on children as well, from not being able to play with their friends to falling behind in school during lockdown, e-learning. And now experts say all that screen time is affecting their eye health. Philip Lee Shanick has the details. Hey, look straight, straight ahead. This eight-year-old is getting fitted for eye braces, corrective lenses worn at night to slow down the progression of myopia or nearsightedness. It was during this past year that he says his eyesight changed. I noticed when, uh, at, when COVID I had to do online, once I looked at the screen so much, everything seemed so blurry. His mom is pretty sure it's a byproduct of online schooling and more time spent at home using laptops or tablets. Because kids, you, you know, the more they are getting screen time, the less time they're spending doing other things, right? So there are some things you need to do on, online, but like we would want to see him do more stuff that's outside. His optometrist says he's noticed a trend among his younger patients, a dramatic progression in myopia over a short period of time, reflected in higher powered lens prescriptions. We used to see mild changes, fairly common, uh, but uh, especially uh, kids who's uh, not outdoor, and a lot of them are not, they're increasing, as I say, minus one to minus two. Okay, so it's, it's actually scary to us, and of course it's scary to the parents. More kids having to wear a pair of these earlier in life have experts concerned that they'll face more serious problems down the road. So if we have a child that's starting with myopia earlier, maybe at five or six, then their prescription is likely to be higher when the prescription plateaus out and stops changing. And with high prescriptions, there's all sorts of risks of long-term effects such as cataracts, glaucoma, retinal degeneration that can have a significant impact on vision. She recommends children see an eye specialist early and often. Some doctors prescribe corrective lenses or special drops that can slow myopia in children, but there are simple solutions too. Uh, first of all, one is get outside, right? So if they have a break, one to one and a half hour outdoor. That's actually, they believe that a lot of city tells us the bright light helps reduce the risk of progression in myopia. Yet another unforeseen side effect of this pandemic, one that will linger long after it's over. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. A mostly overcast sky as we look live at Toronto skyline tonight, and it was certainly feeling cooler and wetter today, just as Colette Kennedy told us it would. Colette's here now with a full look at your weather picture, and Colette, some periods of sunshine today, but nothing compared to what we've had recently. Thanks, Chris. Yes, after just those glorious conditions yesterday, and you know, we need some rain, but got quite a bit of it, especially in the early morning hours that moved through, and obviously those winds bringing our temperatures down as well. So this has really been a big transition day. Now we're behind the cold front. We will get partial clearing, but there's a few areas where we're getting some fog development, a little drizzle too. So not everyone clears overnight tonight. We do have at least a dry day ahead on Saturday. That's important because the next system comes in Saturday night into Sunday, especially the beginning part of Sunday where we'll have some wet weather coming back at us and then into Sunday afternoon that's when uh, we should be able to clear out a little bit breezy though with that system coming through too not as windy as it was earlier today so our daytime highs quite the departure we were more than double that 
uh, yesterday in Toronto, but 10 degrees was the high from today's. That temperature kind of fluctuated through the day. Now, you can see some of that cloud cover, and watch how this sort of changes as I put this in motion through the overnight hours. We see that cloud bank, it kind of shrinks a little bit. Some of these areas, especially along the west end of Lake Ontario, getting into some of that fog, some of that drizzle, but at times it may likely extend back through London and Chatham, Kent, and through those areas too, even Sarnia, where you'll be into some of this fog. So tomorrow morning, then that will burn off. We get variable skies through the day as this next system is coming in. So I can't promise you a lot of sun around the GTA, but there'll be some at times, and then we'll see this coming back in and increasing the cloudiness, and then the rain develops first for southwestern Ontario, obviously, but then it is going to be, and that's even late evening, by the way, before it works its way into Windsor, and then through the overnight hours, coming through the GTA by tomorrow, uh, pardon me, Sunday afternoon, uh, we will see some clearing on the back end of that. And then your temperatures for tonight, these are a big change too. So look at those readings coming back at you into southwestern Ontario. Still pretty nice day there. Increasing cloudiness later in the day uh, there for Windsor as well. And overnight tonight, a look at some of those temperatures. Markham, Newmarket, Aurora, uh, you're going to be seeing those temperatures back to freezing. So a cooler start on Saturday and then warming up into double digits. We'll get there uh, everywhere in terms of my forecast. Sunday, not, the, not necessarily the case. High of 9 degrees with some of that wet weather. But look at this. Look at this, the up and downs of spring, <laughs> ups and downs, seven on Monday with sunshine, 16 on Tuesday. But when that next system goes through on the back edge, Wednesday night, it is possible we could have some flurries coming back through the area, Chris. No way. All right, well, have a good weekend, Colette. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train.
finally tonight, many of us have a lot of reasons to thank our partners, especially during the pandemic. But Chad Breyer has 50 million reasons to thank his tonight after she kept on him to turn in a Lotto Max ticket. I buy the ticket, so I just put it in my cup holder. And my wife here, as crazy it sounds, has been nagging me since last Wednesday that, oh, bring it in the house, bring it in the house. I don't know why, but I guess there was a reason deep down in her heart. She knew that we won, but we didn't know. Well, thank goodness for her. Chad and Krista Breyer from Tavistock, Ontario, unknowingly drove around with the winning ticket for more than a week. They uh, bought it last Sunday for the March 16th draw. It stayed in their cup holder as they ran errands and went to work, never even locking their car. Chad, who's in auto repairs, and Krista, a food industry shift supervisor, have two kids and they plan to spend their winnings on a new home and post-COVID travel while making some charitable donations as well. They bought that winning ticket in Stratford. What a fun story to end on. And that is our show for tonight and for the week. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night.